Welcome to the Pornographers. Today we take you to Hyperacuity Studio in Marina del Rey, California. We'll drop in and catch up with world-renowned visual effects artist, Greg Downing. Put on your VR headset because this episode is filmed in stereoscopic 360 VR video. And join us for an in-depth showcase of Greg's latest VR projects, the Mogao Caves of Dunhuang, the Sansar and Smithsonian Renwick's No Spectators, The Art of Burning Man, and the six Doth Solar Eclipse documentary from the Grand Tetons. Without further ado, I bring you Greg Downing. Hey everybody, welcome to episode three, season two of The Panographers. I'm here with visual effects artist Greg Downing from Hyperacuity Studios. It's been six years since we last sat down and had a discussion about all the amazing work that he's been been up to. And uh, so we thought maybe today would be the time to kind of sit down and catch up. Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few projects to talk about. Yeah, so uh, it, it, I've heard you've been busy. Yes. So let's uh, let's dive in. What can you yeah, what can you share with sure, the audience? Sure. Uh, well, recently uh, I've got a, had a few collaborations uh, with Blue Planet VR, who's Eric Hansen. So you may remember Eric and I from X Res, and uh, with Penogs uh, shooting the Stratosphere. That's right. Yeah, I, I, was, I was there. Yes, <laughs> you were there. You were there. It's privy the to some of the uh, behind the scenes work. Yeah, let's, uh, and so we've got, uh, if you're watching this, if you turn around behind you, so you're looking at us now, just turn around and you can see the screen. Sure. Uh, okay, so this is a little presentation I gave uh, uh, a bit of this at the uh, at SIGGRAPH yep. conference, which, yep, which just, just occurred. Yeah, right? yep, yep. so we're just... It ended yesterday. Yep, we're still recovering from it. Uh, it was a blast. <laughs> All kinds of new stuff and tons of... VR and immersive stuff. It was actually really exciting to see how much uh, VR was at uh, SIGGRAPH. It felt much more mature. I saw more headsets than I've ever seen at this type of graphics events. The, the interesting thing was that we saw a lot more applications of people actually using it for all kinds of things. Yeah. Not, not just like the final product was VR, but for virtual cinema. And um, They even had like a statistics company that was showing their statistical analysis through VR. Yeah, it's, it's encouraging yeah. for our industry as well. Oh, I think yeah. it's great, it's great. Um, so all of that was very exciting about uh, that, but I, along the way, I gave this presentation about this project we're doing, uh, the Mogao Caves, uh, which is in Dunhuang. So this is something, a collaboration between um, uh, the Dunhuang Foundation, uh, the Dunhuang Academy, which is the organization that is charged with maintaining and doing research on the site. Uh, and uh, Hyperacuity, which is my company, and Blue Planet VR, which is Eric Hansen's company. And uh, many of you may remember uh, Eric Hansen and I from x -Res Studio. Uh, so we still have many projects we're collaborating on. Uh, here are some of the uh, projects uh, that we've done in the past. And the goal of the project was to create detail, detailed digital documentation of the site uh, for conservation but primarily to create a virtual reality experience. So it kind of, there were two purposes uh, in capturing uh, this data. And this is just kind of a preview of some of the imagery from the site, so you kind of get a sense of what it's like. Uh, but Dunhuang is in the Gansu province, and it's kind of located uh, 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 north, central, central western uh, China and it's near the border with Mongolia. And uh, for many, many years, for over a thousand years, it was a primary stop along the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. So the earliest Silk Road actually took the more center routes, and the northern and southern routes kind of came later. And so it was a big hub of the, uh, of the Silk Road and was probably one of the wealthier cities of the era because of all the trade going through there. And uh, we can see when we get a little closer view that it is positioned right between the Gobi Desert and the uh, Talimakan, De Taklamakan Desert. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, so the merchants who were coming through Dunhuang had just crossed one of these enormous deserts and they were very dangerous. Um, the Gobi, for instance, I think like 
one third of the uh, uh, merchants perished wow. crossing the desert. <laughs> <It's> unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a rough, a rough road. Um, so it always seemed like a, a good time to uh, make a uh, spiritual and religious offering. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that they would do is they would carve out all of these Buddhist caves. Uh, so this is an aerial view getting closer. And now, um, and see, right here we can see there's a cliff face that um, the ca caves were carved out of. And these are just views of like, what modern uh, uh, Dunhuang looks like. So we see some of the um, uh, street life uh, of the area. Um, and some of the yellow flesh of a donkey. Yes, yeah. So that was a restaurant. So uh, that was. Uh, <laughs> what a name for a restaurant. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, so there's a lot more uh, Islamic influence in this area. So you, you don't see a lot of pork or other things, but um, <coughs> there are some other meats that are eaten. And we've got um, uh, the you know it's basically surrounded by desert. So we've got these enormous sand dunes uh, wow. all around it. So you can see these towering sand dunes that you'd see in certain parts of town. Uh, and this is the aerial view a little closer in of the cave site. So vertically we see the uh, uh, cliff facade there. Um, and then you see kind of a triangle off to the left and that's a, uh, something that the, the Getty Institution helped set up to prevent sand from blowing into the caves. And we've got a little information about the uh, history uh, of the cave. So uh, in 366 uh, uh, AD is when the first uh, cave was carved out. Mm -hmm. And this continued for over a thousand years until around 1500 when that's when the caves were abandoned, mostly because the Silk Road had shifted and had gone over uh, to sea routes. Oh, okay. And so um, eventually it was almost completely abandoned and then rediscovered uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit about the exterior of the facade. So this is looking down the cliff face from the top. And here we've got some close-up photos. So in addition to all of these amazing caves that are carved out, uh, there's a nine-story Buddha. Um, I believe it's the second or third largest Buddha in the world now. Um, it's really an amazing site now. It's all been enclosed uh, to protect it from the elements, but you can imagine uh, going back in time, you know, crossing, you know, you've been on this road for so long and you're, as you're going over the dunes, you're seeing the giant head of a Buddha, nine story Buddha. Wow. And that is the indication that now you are at the frontier and the, uh, the edge of China. So now you're entering China. Um, here's more imagery of the front of the facade. And a lot of the uh, facade, you can see uh, that there's a modern element. Like if I go back a bit here, we can see the kind of uh, new square parts are modern elements. And that was done uh, because they were eroding so quickly. So we can see in places where there are interior caves that can be seen from the exterior. Uh -huh. The front of the cave had basically fallen off. Got it, got it. Uh, so this is all done to protect the site. So we've got some historic photographs that uh, we took in the museum there. We, we, uh, these, these are from the museum. So you can see what it looked like before and after uh, they uh, built this additional protection uh, for the caves. And this is a Im long image of the cave site. So we've got 735 carved caves. 492 of them are painted. Um, so this is all done between the fourth and 14th century giving us 45,000 square meters of murals and more than 2,000 sculptures. So it is a huge, huge site. And many of them are very delicate. Um, the main uh, threat to this is, is visitation. We've got lots of people going there. Uh, the humidity, the humidity yeah. from people's breath, the exhalations, uh, suck salt out of the stone and then cause the, uh, the mud that the um, uh, paintings are painted on to pop off, so we lose big chunks of the paintings mm -hmm. that way. So they're very careful in controlling the site, and uh, they have uh, monitors in every site. You'll see that in the VR experience. Okay. You'll see the I'm little monitors. To check it out. Yeah. 
So anyways, we use photogrammetry to capture this, which is an idea that's been around uh, you know, for more than 100 years. Uh, and we've seen it used in mapping and other, uh, other areas, and most recently in uh, you know, uh, computer-generated stuff where we take the photographs and the computers help us create the photogrammetry, which is just creating 3D models from photographs. And then we brought it into VR. Um, so these are uh, the ways that they protect the site right now is with humidity sensors and uh, using glass uh, to protect it. And you were able to arrange with uh, the folks that, that uh, have these glass yep. protection walls in place to actually remove them yeah. while you were there capturing the Yeah, so we were, were able to remove the glass and shoot it without the glass, um, which amazing. is fantastic, which is, uh, improves your experience quite a bit. Yeah, so I mean, I would imagine that your VR experience of this is actually going to be in some ways better than if you actually go there because... Yeah, in some ways it is. Yeah, go ahead, turn it off. Modern class kind of interfering with you. Yes, yeah. So we've got, um, we shot it under three different lighting setups. Um, they, we had a static setup, uh, uh, camera mounted uh, ring flash, and then uh, uh, Eric built this pretty awesome rig for the natural light because we need to be able to shoot all the natural light before the light moved and we need a lot of photos. So he built a three camera rig that was very useful for that. Um, and then this is the uh, ring flash. So we're seeing it, you, the, what you're seeing it moving around there is the modeling light. Um, so that kind of indicates how we were moving around using poles uh, to photograph the site. Um, but the uh, ring flash, you're not seeing the ring flash flash too much in this. Every once in a while you see it, see it in a frame. Um, so then we took that and we used that to generate the model. So you can see the camera patterns, uh, the 3D models, the fully textured model. Uh, from each of those positions, just to give you an idea of what we recovered. Uh, and, you know, we're using accurate color, accurate measurement within it, so we have correct scale for the whole site. Um, this is an example of some of our imagery, uh, the models recovered, uh, and with the, um, uh, the final model uh, with the texture on it in, yeah, well, that was captured using the same tool. Um, so this is. Wait, are we not? Are we not? Um, we are still capturing. Okay. Does it just pop up every once in a while? Who might test that? No, that's in my previous recording. I used. Oh. Shadow. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, so this is showing some of the detail of the model, and we also had some historic photographs that had. Uh, parts that are missing in the modern facade. Yeah, uh, so the left side, the left corner, you can see that's the area that's missing. And yeah. That's a picture of what it used to look like. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things that we learned about the minerals that they used to, uh, to create the paints. Oh, so you can kind of tell just by looking at a, a cave how old it is because in the earlier Silk Road, they, when less of the Silk Road was open, they had a more limited palette because of the minerals that they had available. Uh, so the earlier palettes are much more limited in the colors and tones that you would see. Yeah. And then later, they, as like Afghanistan and Pakistan opened up, uh, they were able to uh, create a lot more uh, in uh, a wider palette. So this is one of the earliest caves. Um, so this is uh, one of, there are three that are kind of the earliest caves. Um, and we can tell by the tones that are used uh, that it's one of the earliest caves. Um, so this is the cave uh, without just the model. And just a little detail uh, moving around inside the cave. Uh, and this is the third cave, which has a lot of lot more sculptural detail in it. So uh, I apologize. I should have done uh, another capture for this one as well. That's just my cell phone uh, <laughs> pointed at nice. a monitor, so much lower quality capture, but. Uh, Still gives you sense. This is uh, <coughs> from the preview that we did on site. 
Um, so we were shooting every night, or every night we would process what we shot that day. So this is kind of our dailies uh, on site. Um, and it's amazing, uh, you know, it's, we can make it significantly better, which we did, um, by processing it longer, but it's amazing how much longer it takes to make it significantly better. <laughs> So it starts off, you see it, and you're like, wow, that looks great. You're like, we're almost done, and you're really not almost done. Yeah. Uh, but it is exciting to be able to do previews. So ultimately, uh, the goal for this was have a VR experience. Yeah, I'm excited um, to try it So let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's just look at the VR experience now. You are now so this on the is the miniature that we did of the you were looking at the modern uh, exterior facade, facade so we showed kind of like almost like a little diorama in a museum. Point your controller to the cave number to and select it. any of the caves. Uh, so we're highlighting all the caves that we uh, collected data for, and the ones that are complete and in the project have the square around them. So you can sort of point with your flashlight. Up yeah. The so. In your left hand, you've got a frustrum that you can use to point around. In your right hand, you've got a magnifier. So we added this because there's a gigapixel resolution detail in the texture. So I have gigapixel detail for all the walls. And there's a few interesting things about that magnifier. The magnifier, uh, we found that it really looks great when the mag when the display of the magnifier this is really big. Was patronized by you. But uh, the problem with the it being big is that then when you're moving around, it's Buddhist. in your way. Yeah. The cave contains so what we did is we use a gaze to make the, the magnifier grow. The of the so when it's in front of you and you're using it, it's really big. And the second you look away from it, it gets tiny again and it's out of your way. So this is not a finished version of the project. Uh, we are doing this interview while we are in the middle of producing this, so it will probably look more refined uh, when it's complete. And another thing that we have is all those rings that you see with labels the small floating Buddha around that cover the wall are, uh, are fashioned using applique techniques. information kiosks. This means that each so of when the he enters those and he looks in the right direction, uh, and there's the audio surface. starts and some animation in some cases start uh, showing the to explain what it is donors. that he's looking at. And when he leaves those, they stop. So it allows you to kind of navigate through all of this and kind of get just-in-time information. And if you don't have the patience or interest in a particular thing, um, local that will uh, who is a uh, just stop when you wander away. The cave can Yep. And you exit there. Now you're back and you can choose another cave. So where's the, this is the large Buddha, right? The cave that I say? Uh, that, yeah, that's the, the standing Buddha. And then you guys, and so Hyperacuity has shot how many caves? Four? Uh, we've shot six total. Six. And there's 900 or 400 total? Uh, yeah, 492, I think. Yeah, so you, so this could turn into something where you need to go back and finish all the other rooms. <laughs> I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, try, try 158 there. So this is the reclining Buddha. You are now in cave number 158. Built in the year. And there's narration. So when I'm in VR here, I can hear a narrator. Right. Who's kind of guiding me through. Represents um, Buddhist notions I hear a of new, time. Uh, Near the head of the reclining Buddha is Kashyapa, the Buddha of the past. Right. And you'll also see the text with the labels. Maitreya, the Buddha of the future. There's, there's, are there experiences Together, where the additional Buddha content middle, comes up? The cave showed. Yeah. If you try uh, that ring, right, kind of pretty close to where you are, maybe right behind you. Uh, to the left right there. there. Yep. You are now. Uh, the, no, the next one over to the right. Built in this one. Yeah, if one says foreign kings. Okay. Uh, so this one, when you're standing in this one, it'll, it'll bring up that historic photograph. This is an historic oh, photograph there. of the Tibetan. Oh, so yeah. you can Who see can be that, and that's that, so right there. Yeah, I kind of match the position that the photograph is taken from. Right there. Near the feet so it'll the highlight and animate and tell you about the diverse costumes indicate they come from many places across Asia. At the head of the group. 
where the mural is now damaged. It's a, such, it's such a beautiful photogrammetry capture. To his right is a Chinese This location uh, was ideal for it. Every surface is unique, so it works wonderfully with yeah. photogrammetry. Look at the texture on the, the, the hair. And it, it's really, you really feel the scale when you're in here of how large this Buddha is. Yeah, it's all, it's all correct scale as well. So uh, if you ever go there, it will be totally clear uh, uh, that you, you know, you'll know you've been there before. And here's the, 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 um, mo uh, the moisture sensors? Yep, yep, right those here. are the moisture sensors. Uh, they also track temperature and um, temperature and humidity. Fantastic, what yeah. an incredible so experience. Now, 275 has another, a few other special items. This is the earliest cave. Ooh. So it's in this one, flashlight. yeah, we removed, uh, we delit it, and then we... Um, Artists created the oh. statues. Yep, so you stepped on a, one of those rings changes this the lighting. So you can jump back, it's near the door, you yeah, have that one right there. So that changes the lighting back and forth. So now you can use a flashlight to explore it, which is really the way you see it when you go there. So uh, in the slideshow we just saw previously, you basically used a uh, ring light to sort of light each section of the wall mm -hmm. while you were capturing it. Yep. And that's why when you're in the VR, other two caves, that it appears like it's it's daylight. It's it appears like this, yep. where it's lit up the entire room. Right. That, well, there's several reasons to do that. We get better this geometry um, in the shadow the areas, um, and also we can use these do these uh, delighting tricks. I'm, I'm just in, so amazed that you got behind all these like occlusions yeah. zones that yeah. would normally be. So you had to um, basically put cameras up on poles and kind of yeah. get behind. Took took a, a a lot of thought to make sure that you get yeah. all those details. So there's one other there that's interesting. If you find the label that says, if you go to the back of the cave, you can kind of see the different labels better, but there's one that says constructing the Buddha, the earliest caves at okay. or Buddha construction. You are now in cave number 27. Artists created the statues at Dunhuang on a wooden framework. So here you're going to get narration about how the Buddhas were built. They added lightweight Amazing. bundles. So of what we did for this is we um, these reeds with we did photogrammetry uh, in, in the museum where they had a demonstration of how they were built. So they showed all the different pieces and then Eric uh, or took that and um, put a lattice on it, Maya, and kind of bent it into the shape of the Buddha that we had to explain the, how it was built. So it's really nice to be able to see all of that in 3D. It's like you get the sense of the internal structure. Absolutely. It's incredible. Fantastic. Wow, yeah. that is just probably the most amazing photogrammetry experience I've had. Yeah. That Thanks. Beautiful work. Yeah, beautiful. that's that's the one we're probably the, the most excited about. Is it jumpy on there too? Okay, so another interesting experience we've done is if you go to uh, www.sansar.com slash intel. Uh, we did a project with Sansar and Intel. And who is Sansar? So Sansar, uh, it's the same people who made Second Life. Okay. And so what they're really good at is building um, social 3D communities that scale really large. So you can have a huge number of players, a huge number of locations, and you can just kind of uh, travel throughout these locations and meet people in there. So it's largely about being social in 3D. So they've built a... Uh, uh, a social VR app called Sansar. Okay. Do they still use Linden dollars? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly what, what they're they, using what the for currency. For currency. Uh, but uh, it, it, it gives you the opportunity to explore things. And uh, they also let you, you can explore it uh, either in VR or you can explore it uh, just on a, uh, using a keyboard and mouse. Or okay. So there's a number of different ways that you can use uh, to explore it. Uh, but we went and we worked with the uh, Smithsonian Renwick Museum uh, to produce the No Spectators piece. So uh, 
uh, the Smithsonian did a wonderful exhibit on uh, the art of Burning Man. And okay. so they commissioned pieces, they brought a lot of the ephemera that, that you know, has been part of Burning Man over, over time and uh, made a custom installation for the runway. So this is a mix of art that's been on the playa and uh, regular Burning Man artists making custom pieces for the Smithsonian. Fantastic. So uh, in this case, uh, we did not scan the museum. Uh, uh, Sansar built the museum out as a 3D model, okay. but we scanned the, all of the artwork in the museum separately, and then that, those were brought in as separate models. And this was, uh, part of this was accommodating uh, the game engine. Uh, Sansar could be much more efficient with those uh, um, building simpler geometry for the rest of the museum, and then saving all of our detail of the meshes uh, for the artwork itself. Uh, so anyways, we'll take a look yeah, at this. Oh, it looks like we might be doing some more troubleshooting here. I mean, uh, okay. Oh, there we are. Okay. No troubleshooting. We just have to put on the heads up. Uh, so you need some controllers. Okay. So you're going to teleport around again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can also, I think, use the uh, joystick yeah. with your thumb there. Yeah. I think that gives you a regular teleport. Oh, joystick with the thumb. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to go up the stairs because that's going to move another. Well, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> God dang it. Like every demo. <laughs> it's the developer user relationship where the first thing that a user does is the thing that the developer wasn't planning on. Exactly. I'm, and I, I, I'm pretty good at finding breaking games. Yeah, you have a long history of that, right? Yeah. I have game breaker, hashtag game breaker. Um, if I go back down the stairs, will it reload? Yep. Again? Yeah. Okay, okay so, so you're upstairs, so this is the upstairs. Hold, hold and release. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so this is a David Best piece. So David Best has built the temple many years in Burning Man, which is often the most meaningful part to most burners. Uh, it, they're given a chance to uh, write messages to those who have departed in the last year. Oh, wow. And they write them on little blocks of wood. And then at the end of Burning Man, the whole structure is burned, and the idea is that your messages, uh, you know, because there's such a long human history of uh, burning uh, being a, a, a part of ritual, that this is ritualistically carrying your messages uh, to the heavens. So it's a really beautiful structure. So these are all CNC routed uh, wooden panels. So, uh, by the way, you should be alert that you, you may run into someone in this room, it's possible. And uh, this was especially poignant, um, this right after this, uh, uh, Larry Harvey, uh, who is uh, the man responsible for bringing in occurring, has carried us through all these years, uh, had just passed uh, uh, right before we did this capture. And it was very unexpected. And then, should I? Uh, yeah, head out that doorway you came in there. Can I try to find Larry in here? Uh, you, you were just looking at a photo of oh, okay. Larry. So if I, can I come over here, why? That little black and white photo there. Is, Head towards the door there. Yeah, you want to teleport probably. And you can go to the right there. You can go look at some of the other exhibits around the museum. These are mushrooms. They're mushrooms. Yeah, so these were made out of uh, corrugated plastic. So it's kind of like cardboard, you know, it's the same pattern as cardboard. 
Uh, and the whole thing was a giant origami piece. So they were folded and they had motors inside and lights. So you'll see there's a little ring at the base of each. And um, when you activated that ring, is there, is there a way to activate it? I think you stand on it. Uh, it makes the mushroom chain shape, so it should get shorter. Uh, you may have to play with the UI there to get that to work. There we go. Now it's activated. So it's a it's a really interesting, and beautiful transformation. It's all based on the work on me. And it makes these wonderful sounds as well. Yeah, I don't think viewers can hear what I'm hearing. And how did you capture that? Did you guys have to reconstruct this? And uh... yeah, so we did the initial capture where we did photogrammetry and laser scanning yeah. uh, of the site, and then uh, the model had to be uh, rebuilt uh, to run efficiently in the Sansar engine. And then they rigged it uh, and reprojected the textures. And once it was rigged, that allows you to animate it. Now I imagine the sound here is pretty interesting. It's called the gamelan, which is the Balinese drums. But it's all run by uh, small computers. These were interesting patterns projected. Yeah. yeah. So that's something that you couldn't do. Well, this particular one actually did have an opening that you could stick your head in and kind of see what it was like. What does it say on that wall? See that from here. It may have been added. Uh, yeah, so you, I think after this one, you'll have to head back downstairs to see the rest of the art. What does this do? This show I didn't work though. I think that just tells you the name of the piece. So head off through the, through the right there. You see that arch. Okay. Yep. So that this is an interesting couple that makes. Uh, uh, every, they often they've done a lot of Burning Man art. I've seen over the years. And I think they did the temple one year as well. Uh, but they take photos uh, with of one another, and uh, they kind of create these giant. Print. So that it's a giant collage artwork they make. And if you head into the next, next room, you'll see some of the costumes. So these are all done with photogrammetry. Now this was a steel sculpture. So this the materials that this sculpture was made from were extremely difficult to capture using photogrammetry or laser scanning because it would reflect off the surface. Uh, so this was, uh, this was done uh, by Sansar and they created materials and they used the laser scanning data as reference. I remember when you were burning it, it was quite large. Oh yeah, it was much bigger, much bigger. This was a special piece they did that would fit inside of the museum. This is a tin pan dragon, so you can see this is all made out of pans, tin pans, cooking dishes. It's bicycle powered, and it also had, uh, it, you can see the controls for it in there. And it was also, you would puppeteer the head from inside, uh, as well as um, it would, you could trigger it to breathe fire. Some of the interesting places. Oh, yeah. Well, you just passed up a really cool one, which was yeah, the Zoetrope. So, so, this is like a, a portable movie theater? Yeah, this would drive around. 
drive yeah, yeah. is you could drive around the playa and everything. Yeah. yeah, this one was amazing. This was a the Zotrup, so you'd spin it, uh, and you can see there are frames of animation yeah. on that wheel. Oh, that's so cool. It was ridden by three people, and then one of them would carry a strobe light with them, portable strobe light, amazing. and spin it, and then you would see the animation occur. Amazing. Like there's more shadow here. That's so cool. So teleport out here. Yeah, yeah, you can go teleport and see. Uh, so a lot of... The playa. Yeah, it's the playa. So a lot of the art of bringing in so big one fit museums. So part of the exhibit was placing the artwork different places around downtown. Or downtown Washington, D.C. So see these when they load. So on the left there, you've got the Penny Bear, and a lot of these were also strategically placed in the city in places that made sense. So the Penny Bear was put in front of a bank. So it's all made out of uh, uh, Canadian pennies. So Canada, and they were discontinuing the penny. Um, wow. So artists made this artwork uh, wholly out of pennies. That's so cool. And you can actually, in VR, you can like, you can get up close and actually see Physical three-dimensionality of the pennies yeah. there, sort of on the edge of the pennies. This is so cool. Is that next level? These were all cut pieces. That one is Maya Angelou. So when you stood up on the back, there you would hear. Uh, I think that you can try to teleport up on it. I can't remember if this part was disabled. Uh, but at Burning Man, you would stand up in her mind. The idea is why you were in Maya Angelou's mind. You can see there's a reference to uh, why the cage bird sings. And when you stand up behind that, you would hear her voice uh, reading you a poem. Coming out of the speakers now. So the way we use this was uh, at conferences and other events uh, when we knew there were going to be a lot of people in this particular world. Uh, I would come in and I would talk to people in VR that had also showed up in this world and explain to them how the photography was done, how, how we shot it, um, and uh, also the curator of the museum would come in and would explain to people everything, basically give them a guided tour. Uh, of the complete exhibit. So it's a wonderful way to experience art to have someone with such expertise giving you the explanation. So uh, a number of these pieces, I collaborated with uh, Insight Digital with us. So Kevin Kane from Insight Digital, who's a, a another longtime collaborator of mine that uh, I've worked with him on a number of projects over a very long period of time, a lot of cultural heritage and uh, museum-related work. And so we both worked together uh, on this to do all the different types of scanning. So we worked together uh, on the photogrammetry, etc. You look down into that eyepiece. Okay. Oh wow. It's amazing that you were able to get it to appear only in one eye. So like if I look at my left eye, there we go. Wow, look at that. It's so realistic, it feels like I'm really there. And you've got some particles or something floating in the air here. Yeah, that just kind of helps the, the spatial feeling. Oh, there you are. Hi, Greg. <laughs> so.
So this is in Grand Teton National Park. That's that's Grand Teton right back there. Okay. And I think you can probably tell that it's starting to get darker. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, well, let's look back in the front piece. Oh yeah, here we are. Look at that. Now the other thing to note is you can lean in pretty far so you can get close to the Oh yeah. Oh wow. You can hear the sound feedback. You got like the sun burning the sound feedback. really dark outside now. Crickets came out because it got dark. Yeah. There are a lot of things that were happening that I was observing. I kind of had to add back. Okay, so you just discovered the uh, uh, little secret passage here. That's wow. Just a little Easter egg we added. If you look, oh, the moon. yeah, right above you. Oh, you want to grab? I can grab it. I can touch it. <laughs> I want to take reach. it and throw it. Sun is orbiting. Okay. Wow. Look at that. And you actually have a layer of the, like the, the depth of clouds. Yeah, a separate layer. Separate layer. Beautiful. Did you kind of come back out. Yeah. So if you look at there, you go. If you look at that, you'll hear a sucking sound. And when you back away from the national park, like right back here. There you go. Oh, what's that light? Was it your headlamp down there? Yeah. So now you're kind of back, it's starting to emerge from the clubs. That's cool. the end. Fantastic. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> Very cool. Glad you liked it. So it's a kind of a cool combination of, of techniques that I haven't seen before. Yeah. So that's it's a high, nice hybrid of like sort of, of like time lapse photography mixed right. with solar photography, which, you know, ast uh, astro photography, yeah, astro -photography. Where, where you're tracking, yeah. um, you know, objects in our solar system, and then you've got photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. You've got 360, 360 video. video. You've got. Um, I was shooting HDRI as well. HDR. I mean, man, it's like a whole. Yeah. Like you mentioned a big bag of tricks all kind of mixed together. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a, quite a dance for that. Yeah. And then just basic 3D modeling for the Easter egg and for the telescope and. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it's right. impressive. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I hope everyone else that uh, is watching this gets a chance to also experience it for themselves in VR. So. Hopefully we can share those links when we 
when we get them, if we get them. Hopefully we will. All right. Okay, so we're back after a, a short uh, cat break. We had to yep. feed the cat. Feed the cat, get them <laughs> in some beer, and we're doing better. Yeah. So um, we probably don't have a time. We have a long list of projects that, that Greg has worked on that, that I'd love to share, but each project is just so amazingly sort of interesting and complex right. into itself that it's. I think we'll have to uh, kind of make the call just to um, maybe wrap up you know, I don't know. Sure. Is there anything else we can quickly mention? And maybe we can show like like a just a sneak peek image of it. Maybe when we have another episode, we can uh, yeah we can revisit. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, next time we could talk about the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's another one that's uh, a fun experience to talk about and uh, yeah. Exciting and you've been to back see. to Easter Island since we last spoke with you. We I think yep. the last season of Pinocchio's you showed some. Uh, of your photogrammetry Easter Island scanning. Yep. You've yep. been back there. Um, or any other places you've traveled? Mm, you've been uh, I did a State Department job teaching uh, uh, some Aboriginals in the Yurkala tribe uh, in Northern Australia Okay. Uh, uh, how to create VR. So that was a fun thing to yeah. learn about their song lines and oh, um, amazing. Uh, help them uh, capture some of their sacred spaces. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I think we said goodbye yesterday, but we'll make some. And I think I asked you what, where you saw this, this technology heading and, and what were some inspirations from, from SIGGRAPH 2019. Um, it's been 24 hours. Has there been any other additional thoughts that might have popped into your head since then regarding you know, things you've showed us? Maybe, maybe let me rephrase there, reframe the question. With everything you know and everything you've done, is there any sort of dream project that you'd like to put out into the universe? You know, that would, that if you like. Yeah, I mean, one day what I'd really like to do, having done this uh, Mogao Caves project, one dream project for me would be to do a project on the entire Silk Road. And Amazing. hit all the major Silk Road sites and tell the story of the Silk Road. Um, it's it's such a an amazing rich history and it you know it it impacted Europe the Middle East uh, China obviously all of Asia yeah uh, that that period of the intermingling of ideas and goods and people uh, yeah is, and the is epic journey that it took I mean yeah. the harrowing there's so many good stories uh, along that route I. That would be like the dream title for yeah. to do, but access to every site would be extremely difficult. Yeah, getting, yeah. getting the access would be hard. Well, I know uh, Felix and Paul just showcased the work that they did with ZCam um, and having, you know, um, I think it was in the space, the yeah. International Space Station. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, how about a light field capture up there? I think that would be awesome. Yeah, I would love to see it. Yeah, awesome. Well, Greg, thank you so much for for having me down here in Los Angeles yep. and for showing me some of your amazing work. And uh, uh, where can people, I think we showed your website yesterday, hyperacuity.com. Sure, sure. You described what the meeting was that. Anywhere else they can find you? Can they follow you on Twitter? or They can follow me at Greg Downing on Twitter. Okay. Um, they can see uh, work that Eric Hansen and I have done together on XRES. There's still several projects up there. And, you can go check out Eric's uh, new site, uh, Blue Planet VR. Um, yeah. So there's a number of different places uh, you can find stuff that I've either collaborated with others on or um, stuff I've done on my site. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. And uh, until next time. Ciao.